This is CBC Here and Now. Good evening, I'm Anthony Germain. And I'm Carolyn Stokes, and as you can see, my co-host is out of the studio tonight. That's right, Carolyn. I'm at the boathouse just off Kitty Vitty Lake where families who've been united by a tragedy 10 years ago are gathering at a special event, a book launch here, but it's more than a book launch. It's people remembering what happened 10 years ago. Stay tuned. We're going to meet some of the families from a tragedy that happened and changed their lives forever. But first, back to Carolyn with some of the top news stories today. Thanks, Anthony. And we begin the news in the courts. A jury learned today what first responders saw when they were called to the home of Trent Butt on April 24th, 2016. Butt is accused of first degree murder in the death of his five year old daughter, Quinn Butt. Here now is Mark Quinn is live in the newsroom. And again tonight, a warning that some details may be disturbing to some viewers. So, Mark, what happened? Well, that's right, Karen. It was another heavy day, and we heard from first responders who described that day when they found Quinn Butt at that burning home in Carboneer. And Carboneer uh, volunteer firefighter Ian Green was one of the first to enter that burning home. Green said he went through a closed door and saw a little girl laying on the middle of a bed. She was wearing pink, and he said it was visible through the smoke. He said, you could tell Trent was still alive. I stepped in to get him, and I stepped into a pool of blood, said Green. There was a laceration on his arm and a lot of blood. Now, Green was the firefighter who found Quinn and carried her outside. Uh, he said it was just like she was asleep. She was pristine, complete. Now, Raymond Verge was another first responder at Butt's home that morning. He told the court, quote, when we arrived, we jumped out of the ambulance and I saw a firefighter carrying that little angel, he said. And he said that was a sight he will never forget. Now, items found in Butt's home after the fire included a lighter, gas cans and a box cutter. Justice Donald Burge told the jury yesterday that Butt has pleaded guilty to arson, but T Trent Butt has pleaded not guilty to first degree murder. Now the trial is expected to continue again tomorrow. It is going more quickly than expected, and many are saying now that it may finish before the allotted three weeks. Live in St. John's, I'm Mark Quinn for Here and Now. And police are on the scene of an incident on Craig Miller Avenue this evening. The road has been blocked off from Ryan Street to Fraser Place. Police say the incident has been contained, but are asking the public to stay away from the area to, to ensure safety. Neighbors say police have been there for the past five hours. It's unclear as to why police were called and how long the road will be blocked. And a small protest was held outside Her Majesty's Penitentiary this morning. Former inmates and families want to see better conditions inside the jail and enhanced addiction rehabilitation. Mike Williams organized the protest. He spent more than 20 years in prisons across the country. He says the conditions in HMP are the worst he's seen. He wants government, politicians and the community to come together for change. Uh, that's that's hell in there. That's torture. If we had more support from government to help, this is getting closed down. This is not a joke. I will either die of hunger, I will freeze to death, and this is serious. To national news now, there was no apology from the Prime Minister regarding the SNC-Lavalin affair this morning. But Justin Trudeau does say losing two senior ministers has taught him some important lessons. Here's how he described the conflict with his former Attorney General Jody Wilson-Raybould. What has become clear through the various testimonies is that over the past months, there was an erosion of trust between my office and specifically my former principal secretary and the former Minister of Justice and Attorney General. I was not aware of that erosion of trust. As Prime Minister and leader of the federal ministry, I should have been. Now, Trudeau has addressed the controversy before, but in his news conference this morning, well, that was the first time he's made himself available to the media to talk specifically about the affair. And the Prime Minister was meant to head to Iqaluit this afternoon to apologize for the mistreatment of Inuit with tuberculosis. But bad weather grounded his plane in Happy Valley Goose Bay. Snow and wind in Iqaluit forced multiple flights from Ottawa to turn back and landed the Prime Minister in Labrador. Here now is Jacob Barker reports. 
Well, as you can see, the weather here in Goose Bay isn't very forgiving either. There's uh, quite a strong wind that I'm feeling here at the Goose Bay Airport and uh, a lot of blowing snow. So he is stuck here for the time being, trying to get up to a Iqaluit where he can uh, take part in this historic apology to tuberculosis uh, victims there from the mid 20th century. It's a highly anticipated event. So all eyes are on the skies here and, and the skies in Iqaluit um, hoping to get uh, the Prime Minister up there so that this uh, historic event can take place. Jacob Barker, CBC News, Happy Valley Goose Bay. And we have an update on that. Uh, we've just heard from the Prime Minister's press secretary that Trudeau is now heading back to Ottawa. The apology has been delayed until tomorrow, weather permitting. While in Happy Valley Goose Bay, she says the Prime Minister visited a local restaurant and spoke with the fire chief. And this is why Trudeau was diverted to Labrador. Iqaluit suspended its services for the day while government offices were closed and the visibility, visibility is only getting worse. Yeah, and Iqaluit wasn't the only place dealing with bad visibility today. We've got, uh, this is a picture from St. Mary's Bay. Newfoundland Curtis Critch sent us that photo. And then about 15 minutes later, this is what it looked like. So near zero visibility, We've seen this uh, through most of the day today, and that's thanks to some snow squalls. You can see on the satellite and radar uh, those bands of snow squalls continuing for most of the Buren Peninsula, Avalon, and along the west coast. Now, the snow squalls will generally continue as we head through the overnight. Shouldn't be as intense, though, uh, but it's because of these cooler temperatures. So this is what we woke up to this morning. The coldest morning so far in Badger at minus 29 and then temperatures have climbed quite nicely, still below seasonal, though, but about 20 degrees warmer uh, this afternoon in Badger at minus nine. Otherwise, we're seeing those temperatures in the minus uh, double digits along the west coast and then uh, closer to the minus single digits towards the Avalon. Now, these colder temperatures, like I said, are uh, leading to these snow squalls. This will generally continue as we head through the day tomorrow. Up through Labrador, a little bit of a break tomorrow as far as snow goes, but then another round of snow and blowing snow moves in tomorrow night and through the day on Saturday. I'll have all those details in your full forecast when I come back. Carolyn? Thanks, Ashley. Well, the record run is over. Vehicle sales in this province have plummeted in recent years, returning to a level we used to see before the oil and construction boom superheated our economy. Terry Roberts has the numbers, the reaction, and this story. It's the fancy new option on this year's Sierra pickup. Easier access with the touch of a button. But one thing that isn't easy is selling them. Light vehicles like these are not moving like they used to. The economy has just adjusted to the current economic realities. This past November, December has probably been the worst I've seen. The numbers tell the story, and they're sobering. In 2013, a record number of new cars, SUVs, and pickups moved off dealership lots in this province. The bonanza continued for a few years after that. There were more people out there uh, uh, making the bigger incomes, there's no question about that, and, and, and money was uh, somewhat flowing uh, um, easier. But a series of economic hard knocks has shaken up the auto sector. And the big hit came last year, sales down by more than 9%, catching the attention of one of Canada's best known auto analysts. That's a real red flag, although last year was a difficult year for many provinces, but most of them were down by 1% or 2%. Some of them kind of stood out, you know, like a sore thumb, being down almost 10%. Used vehicle dealers are also hurting. Bankruptcies are increased. Repossessions of vehicles has increased. And Gordon says some of his commission-dependent colleagues have left the business altogether. The problem with a lot is they can't afford to continue making no money and dealerships are changing the way they do business. We hope to uh, uh, manage our inventory tighter and, and, and turn it quicker. Uh, just a slightly different business model, that's all. Despite the decline, sales are still higher than they were prior to and during the early years of the economic boom, suggesting this latest trend is more of a correction. The market is still strong in the first two months of this year. That's what we're continuing to forecast. Terry Roberts, CBC News, St. John's. 
We have new, new information on the Sea Rose oil spill tonight, including the price to this province. It was the largest spill in Newfoundland and Labrador's history, and documents obtained by CBC found officials failed to mention a Fogo Island-sized sheen at the time of the leak. Here and now is Katie Breen is live in the newsroom. So Katie, what's this about Fogo? Well, four months ago when the spill happened, oil officials said there was a sheen. What they didn't say is just how big this sheen got. About 250,000 liters of oil, water and gas leaked into the ocean after a connector failed. Officials were upfront about that, but the size of the ensuing slick, eventually measuring 21 kilometers by 8 kilometers, roughly two thirds the size of Fogo Island, wasn't mentioned. Today, government reacted to that level of transparency, saying the amount spilled is most important. First of all, the 250,000 liters is far more accurate. So sea states change. We all know that. We're Newfoundlanders and Labradorians. We know the sea changes moment by moment. So what you might see in an aerial uh, view or what you might see from a ship will change. Now in saying that, Cody says disclosure will be brought up in CNLOPB's review of the oil spill, which is going to look at everything, including communications. And Katie, how is that investigation into the spill going? Well, it's still underway, and government says it's going to stay that way until operations resume. Right now, only one of six wells is operational. In order for the others to be brought online, Husky needs four straight days of good weather, which of course is difficult to come across here. Crews are apparently on standby to make it happen, but in the meantime, the province is missing out on revenue from production. So far, that's estimated at $70 million. The revenue is not lost, it is deferred. The oil is still in the ground, and at some point uh, we'll get the revenue. I would have preferred to have gotten it in this year's budget, obviously. Um, it, you know, it, it would have helped to in ensure that our, our forecasts and so on remain uh, what we had uh, put out. But, I mean, we will get the revenue at some point. So far, it's $70 million the government doesn't have to work with. The budget for 2019 is expected out next month. Live from the newsroom, I'm Katie Breen for Here and Now. Well, details are out on a review of this province's post-secondary education system. Advanced Education and Skills Minister Bernard Davis announced an independent review committee which will examine all aspects of post-secondary involving Memorial University and College of the North Atlantic. The three-person committee will report back to government in the fall of 2020. It will review ways to strengthen the system while making sure the demands of the labor market and students are met. This is the first time in 14 years that post-secondary has undergone a review in this province. And while this review was originally announced a year ago, Minister Davis says they wanted to get the terms of reference right. Well, it's not about how long it took. We had, to, we had the terms of reference, we put them in a draft format. We had all party, all stakeholders, Memorial, um, College of the North Atlantic student organizations had the ability to, to look at those references, get involved in the process, ensure that those terms of references um, were, were satisfactory and solid for what they're looking for. And uh, we wanted to make sure that we got it done right. Well, students at Memorial University have overwhelmingly voted against including a Metrobus pass in their annual fees. 71% of voters were against the U-Pass proposition, which would have added about $250 to student fees each year. Metrobus was hoping the pass would boost user numbers and allow them to improve service around the city. The Board of Regents has their final say, but the university administration says the students have spoken. That means that uh, we will we will be recommending to to the board that we not proceed uh, with the UPass. If 70% of the students don't want to go on by want to be on the bus, then uh, that's that's a that's a strong voice. We always said that we're going to put out a, a process uh, to hear from them in a in a in a pan campus vote, which we did, uh, and we always said that it would influence our decisions, and uh, uh, and that's our decision to do that. I'd love to. And 20 years after a cultural program started in this province, its founder was honored today in the House of Assembly. 
This rug in the lobby of Confederation Building shows the 90 countries that have been represented by Sharing Our Cultures. The organization was started by Loideta Cuego in 1999 with the aim of getting high school students to celebrate each other's cultures. 34 students work together with donated rug hooks to complete the project. Cueco says the program has done wonderful things for children across the province. I think it's created a lot of awareness of the diversity that we have here because it has opened up the opportunity, provided a platform for high school students to share their cultures with the public, something they didn't have prior to that time. And it's uh, the public, actually, the community has embraced it. Well, Carolyn, uh, as you can tell, if you look behind me, it's a fairly busy place. Uh, a number of people have come here to the boathouse on Kitty Vitty Lake. And it's for a particular reason, and it has to do with this book launch, 18 Souls. We're going to meet the author a little later in here now. But first, I want to introduce you to Noelle Breen, because Noelle is one of the people here who lost somebody 10 years ago. Appreciate you coming here, Noelle. Thank you. Thanks for having us. Um, here it is 10 years later. You were you about 30 when, when the crash happened? Uh, no, uh, I'm 35, so I was about 25, okay, 25. when it happened. And uh, yeah, I was still living at home, actually, uh, in the process of, of moving out. So I was still living at home when it happened, so I got to be there for my family and stuff when it happened, which was good. So uh, your father, Peter, uh, was lost in this. Um, what, are you, what are you thinking about on a night like this? Um, it's a night full of a lot of emotions, I guess. It's hard coming up upon the 10-year anniversary. Um, I'm really thankful and really grateful that Rod decided to write this book and get the stories of all the people out there. It's not, um, not something that everybody's uh, aware of, um, that aspect of it. We usually get the technical part of it, right. uh, the stuff about the crash and whatnot, but not the actual right. people themselves. Now, I should say when Noel talks about Rod, that's Rod Etheridge. Uh, he's the author of this book and we'll be meeting him later in the program. Why was it important in your mind to, to actually have a book like this written? Because as you know, mm -hmm. not all family members wanted to actually talk to the author. It's still very difficult for some people why does it matter for me personally um, I have two young girls they're three and five years old they obviously never got to meet their poppy Pete that's what we call him and that's what we refer to him as um, and I also have nieces and nephews that that never got the chance as well as all the other families um, this book is something that they're going to be able to read as they get older they're going to be able to pass it down to their children so on and so forth so for them to be able to actually have those memories and read them um, in a book like that to me is something really special and something that I really hope that will be cherished for a long time. One final question, obviously I think anybody who has suffered any kind of loss, uh, a profound loss that you have, I mean, how do you, how do you sort of answer the question about what, what was not? Um, in the sense of all the things that were missed? Um, you know, it's it certainly brings a lot of anger about. Um, once again, personally, um, you know, my father never got to walk any of us down the aisle, be there for their pop. So there's a lot of things that he missed out on. With that being said, there is not a day that goes by that we don't speak about them. Um, you know, their memory lives on constantly in the day, in the stories we tell, in the stories that um, everybody will now get to read as well in this book. So. Noel, appreciate your time tonight, and thanks for dropping thanks Thank by. I appreciate it. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right. We'll have more stories uh, here live from the Boathouse of Kitty Vitty later on Here and Now.
Hey, Chrissy. Hey, you ready to go for our big night out? What's going on? I thought we were going out. It's freezing out. It's winter. Come on, aren't you ready? We talked about this. I've got dinner reservations, tickets to the show. It's time to go. Come on, let's get the stink of house off you. All right, bye. Tune in to the St. John's Morning Show to win restaurant vouchers, tickets, and other things that'll force you to leave the house. Come on, we're going to be late, Chrissy. Nice out. Yes, come on, i got to get the stink of house off you. Weather update is brought to you by 811 Healthline. Medical advice, health information, mental health, and healthy eating. Dial 811. It's free and confidential. <laughs> laughing at Fred and Chrissy. That was a great commercial. <laughs> that was really good. <laughs> and, you know, getting the, the stink of a uh, house off you. Today was a day to get out at certain points in the day, but other points in the day, it was blustery and snow squalls. Yeah, that old, or the saying that they say, you know, if you don't like the weather, wait five minutes. Yeah. Certainly was true today. One minute driving home for lunch, I needed my sunglasses, and the next we were in whiteout conditions. So uh, that's the nature of these snow squalls. Yep. And that's because we're seeing these colder temperatures. And it was cold today. Taking a look at the temperatures right now, we're sitting in the minus teens across the board um, and then about minus 10 in St. John's here up through Labrador. Same thing, minus 19 in Lab City. But if we take a look at the setup right now, that low pressure system that we were talking about yesterday is off the coast of Labrador and it's starting to move back, which means a little bit of a relief tonight as far as snow goes, but then another round will move in as that low pressure system starts to uh, move a little bit further south. Otherwise, classic snow squall setup. If we zoom in a little bit, you can see those streamers, those onshore streamers uh, for the west coast and then same along the south coast add in that uh, radar and that's exactly what we're seeing. So the snow squalls as we head through the next couple of hours will likely ease up a little bit. We are still looking at that potential for snow squalls through the overnight, but won't uh, be quite as many specifically down through uh, the Beeren Peninsula. We could see that risk of snow squalls again tonight up through Labrador along the coast. Things should taper off by the time the early morning rolls around, certainly by tomorrow afternoon along the coast, but it won't last too long. We're going to see another round of snow move in, but those temperatures tonight are going to drop again. So it's another cold night overnight tonight, sitting in the minus teens along the west coast with that risk of snow squalls. Those winds will ease slightly out of the west, still upwards of about 50 kilometers per hour. We're going to see that for uh, the northeast coast as well with gusts near 60 kilometers per hour. And then that potential for uh, some scattered snow squalls tonight. Again, those temperatures around minus 12 is your overnight low in St. John, St. for Marystown, Port of Basque, going down to about minus 19. Lower lying areas will likely see those temperatures dip into the minus 20s yet again tonight. Now for Labrador, Lab City sitting at minus 28 tonight. So another cold one with that risk of flurries again, eventually tapering off by morning. And then those northwest winds still staying breezy. Uh, Nain is actually under a blowing snow advisory, likely going to see these blowing snow advisories or potentially uh, some blizzard conditions at times as well as we head towards Saturday. And that's because of that system again. So here's a, a look at your Friday tomorrow. Again, that risk of snow squalls along the west coast and the south coast, as well as the Avalon Peninsula tomorrow. Can't rule out the chance of a few flurries through central as well as uh, we get into some more uh, snow squall setups. And then there's that snow for Labrador. Going to continue to track a little bit further south. But temperatures tomorrow are going to stay quite cold yet again in the minus single digits with the sun peeking out at times in those squalls. Those winds will stay strong right across the board. Uh, minus eight for Grand Falls winds are same for Gander. And then Harbor Breton sitting around minus seven. Similar temperatures along the west coast. Those winds will shift slightly out of the southwest into the afternoon tomorrow, but stay quite breezy. Sunshine up through Labrador at least through the first half of the day, as I mentioned. Then that snow starts to move in. Those winds will pick up, but not till later on in the day. So look for snow and blowing snow as we head towards the morning hours on Saturday. So that's a look at your forecast. I'll, we'll look ahead towards the weekend when I come back. Carolyn?
Thanks, Ashley. Well, as you heard earlier in the show, the Prime Minister did not apologize today for his role in the SNC-Lavalin controversy, but Justin Trudeau did admit to a communications breakdown between his office and Jody Wilson-Raybould. Trudeau blamed what he called an erosion of trust as the cause of her resignation from Cabinet. But as David Cochran reports, that has only served to intensify the opposition's calls for Trudeau to step down. It was an act of contrition that did not include an apology. Almost every day as Prime Minister, I learn new things. So I can tell you without a doubt that I have taken and will continue to take many lessons from these recent days and weeks. The Prime Minister admits he could have done things better but insists nobody really did anything wrong. In regards to standing up for jobs and defending the integrity of our, our rule of law, um, I continue to say that there was no inappropriate pressure. No inappropriate pressure, he says, just strong disagreement and intense misunderstanding as the Prime Minister and his staff pushed the former Attorney General in a quest to protect jobs. I think people uh, understand that, Can that a Canadian government always needs to stand up for workers, needs to stand up for jobs, needs to look to grow the economy and that is something that, that all Canadians right across the country expect of their government. It's now beyond dispute that he and his office bullied and threatened Ms. Wilson-Raybould in an attempt to get her to let SNC-Lavalin off the hook. Nothing the Prime Minister said or could say will convince the opposition, but Trudeau is trying to convince Canadians they can still trust his government. He's going to hire outside experts to review many things, including the way his office interacts with Cabinet. Being able to demonstrate that we continue to defend our institutions despite um, internal challenges is something that I think Canadians can, uh, can deeply be reassured by. That's the hope that despite a month of controversy and two cabinet resignations, Canadians will believe that everything is fine. David Cochran, CBC News, Ottawa. And NDP leader Jagmeet Singh isn't satisfied either. He's also sticking to his message and repeating his calls for a public inquiry into the matter. But we didn't see an apology. We didn't see really an admission of fault. We saw kind of a sidestep, um, collateral kind of comments that were made. It didn't really get to the heart of the matter. We've got two senior ministers that resigned. We've got Ms. Wilson-Raybould and Ms. Philpott, both of them pointing to serious concerns about political interference. An artist who calls this province home gets one of the biggest honors an artist can get in this country. Next, we hear from Marlene Kreitz on receiving the Governor General's Award.
The business that began with one little girl and one orphan duck. A sure thing, Sunday at noon and Monday at 7. Welcome back. Well, this coming Tuesday marks a profoundly sad event for the province. Cougar helicopter flight 491 lifted off bound for offshore oil facilities, but quickly ran into engine problems. The chopper attempted to return to St. John's when it crashed into the ocean. Only one of the 18 passengers on board survived. So let's go back now to Anthony, who's live at an important event for the families who lost loved ones that day. Anthony? Yeah, Carol, that's right. I mean, this is a book launch, as I mentioned earlier on here now, but for many of the family members of people who were lost 10 years ago, this is much more than a book, although we will be talking with the author uh, towards the end of here now tonight. Uh, Kevin Duggan's son, Wade, was one of the people who perished. Uh, Mr. Duggan, can you believe it's been 10 years? I can hardly believe it's 10 years, to tell you the truth now, God, the truth. But it must have been more than years has passed because one time I couldn't speak on this subject, say, when you're two, three years. It's getting a little easier now to speak, with whatever. Even I, even I'm speaking right now, it's, it's not the way I should be speaking, right? You're thinking about your son? Yeah, God, yes. I mean, I think my son, I want to take my son. If so many things brings it back to perspective, I mean, if I look up and see a helicopter, I mean, you know, there it is, right, right in front of you. I mean, it's right there in front of you. Like a small thing. But I pick up a hammer, it's not very much. A hammer's not much. But myself and Wade, Wade was a good partner too, right? And he helped me with a lot of things. I was the golfer, grab the hammer, father. So everything comes back with reflection, I'll tell you that right now. Yeah, I guess it takes, you know, they, they say that time heals wounds, but I guess some wounds take a very, very long time. Uh, it, you feel a little bit better, yes. You ease off. Like I said, I can speak here right now. But the only time you want to forget this is when they stick you down that ground there, look. As far as I'm concerned, you're not forgetting, you're not, you're just not forgetting it's impossible. There's too many things to remind me of Wade. I mean, Wade was a pretty good job for He He played hockey and this and that and other thing. I went with him even to a practice, you know. We loved it. We loved yeah. it. You know, and you actually have a hockey tournament in his in his name, right? Yeah, the boys offshore, you know, and they, they come up with this idea. I mean, my God, it was fantastic. I mean, what they do on all the rigs offshore, this puts teams in. One time they only had one tournament, but now they do two tournaments for the people, three weeks, three weeks, you follow me? The people have three weeks, more in three weeks again, and then right. they, they uh, go with that. Oh, they raise, they raise an awful lot of money, I tell you that right now. And, and this is on your son's name. A, a, a difficult question, though, is you have another son, Gregory, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Gregory's, Gregory's offshore right now, to tell you the truth now. And uh, he, he had a hard time the first time coming back in, right? But I heard through some of the senior men out there, they didn't, none of them want to get back to helicopter you know, when the, the first trip back in, right? Well, how did you feel when, when Gregory actually got on a helicopter the way Wade did to actually head yeah, to work? Well, well, Greg told me he was the first one on the helicopter when they're coming back in, so all the rest of the boys followed him. So, uh, you know, we had to do it. I mean, you had to get a job to do. You got a wife to support, a child support right now. Right. You know, so, I mean, she's eight years old. But I guess as a father who lost one son in an offshore accident, you must, you must have some some concern sometimes. Oh yeah, yeah, tell me about it. I mean, so he goes, when he's going offshore, uh, I mean, I'm on the computer every minute just to see. They'll, they'll tell you when they, when they leave St. John's, during the offset to Hibernia or whatever, and I, I don't need the computer. I find he's offshore, you know what I'm saying? Right. Now, don't tell Greg that, okay? I won't tell him, and if he's offshore, he's he offshore. might not be watching here. Now, listen, yeah. it's a real pleasure to meet you, and I know it's not easy, but thank God you very much. You. God bless, thank you everybody out there. All right, good night. Coming up a bit later in here now, we'll meet the author and tell you about his CBC connection. That's coming up.
Welcome back to Here and Now. Well, she's lived in this province for over three decades and created art that is a love story to the land. And now artist Marlene Kreitz is receiving one of the highest honours this country can bestow, the Governor General's Award for Visual and Media Arts. The award not only highlights her long career as an artist, but also shines a spotlight on the beauty and texture of Newfoundland and Labrador itself. Kreitz was born in Montreal, but her mother's family is from Fogo, and that's why she came here in 1985 and has been here ever since. She's now the first resident of this province to receive the Governor General's Award for Visual Arts. This afternoon, we met up with her outside her home in Portugal Cove to talk about the world that inspires her. I discovered that I, I just loved it here. Everything here has so much meaning to me and, and what happens here matters to me and it's important to me. And the rich culture here and, and, and the rich natural environment, it just has been an abundant source for me, for my, for my artwork that I'm so grateful for. I was very surprised to receive this award. It's very, very unexpected. Um, but of course, I'm very proud and I'm really proud because I'm an environmental artist and it's a real acknowledgement for envir contemporary environmental art and also as I understand it, it's the first time an artist in Newfoundland and Labrador has received this award. For me, environmental artist is I, I work with the environment. I work with the natural environment and sometimes actually the built environment. Um, and I try to do just simple gestures towards the environment to uh, try to come to some understanding about my curiosity about our relationship to the environment. So sometimes I'll take a photograph, sometimes I'll make a video, <laughs> sometimes I'll write a poem. Uh, I use different means to sort of look at that relationship between us human beings and the natural world. Well since we're standing here in the patch of boreal forest where I've been working for uh, 17 years now, uh, what I've been doing is I've been just photographing my hand on certain trees here in the forest. But these are trees that I say I've individuated. I know them, but as the years go by, I become familiar with more and more little parts of this terrain. Just simply see my hand on the tree, but as the years go by, of course, my hand is aging. So that's sort of another interesting part of my way of proceeding is accepting the fact that things are constantly changing. I have used trail cameras, mm -hmm. which are triggered by the movement of wildlife. They have an infrared detector. And then the results are not like classic wildlife photography. Sometimes I just get the rear end of a moose, you know, just exiting the, the image, or I just get the nose just poking in. I really like these sort of serendipitous um, off angle images. And I compare, because the cameras are digital, they register the exact time that the animal activated the camera. And I have handbooks that tell me about what was happening in the celestial vents overhead at that moment. So I'm comparing the, the activity at ground level, the wildlife, with what was happening overhead in the celestial events. What I'm doing next, and what I'm actually currently working on is, um, I'm working on terms in the Newfoundland dialect for the wind and local weather lore about the wind. Uh, I did a lot of work about terms in the Newfoundland dialect for ice and snow and winter weather. I've since discovered that there's a lot of terms in the Newfoundland dialect for the wind and a lot of weather lore about the wind. So I'm working on another video that will incorporate um, those, those aspects of the wind. My work is really just about paying attention to something that's already there. Um, I do feel that the award really largely is for Newfoundland and Labrador because it has provided me with the material for my artwork.
Meet Caleb. I blame the doctors for it. I blame God. I was mad about the things that I didn't say and what, you know, things I could go back and change, the memories that we never got to make. Listen up. Thursdays on your local CBC Morning Show. This weather update is brought to you by Beltone, helping the world hear better. Week goes by so quickly. It's yes, Thursday, it and that is. means it's a Weather Whiz Kid Day. It is. We have another edition of the Weather Whiz Kid today. We welcome Isla Rowe into the Weather Whiz Kid Club, and here is her beautiful drawing. She is dreaming of a snow day and very excited that it happened. <laughs> <laughs> She's seven years old from Corner Brook. Thank you so much for sending that uh, wonderful drawing in. Lots of snow days this year. Oh, certainly lots I, of snow days. I wonder days. how it compares to past years. I'm not sure, yeah. but there's a photo of oh, her there. She's lovely. Yeah, enjoying that snow day. Thank you so much for sending your drawing in. If you want to be part of our Weather Whiz Kid Club, send your uh, drawing, your photo, your address, your age to nlphotos.cbc.ca and uh, we'll get you on. Great. Mm -hmm. So we're getting close to the weekend. How we uh, is the weather looking? Well, into Saturday, uh, up through Labrador specifically, it's going to be a little bit of a, a windy, messy day mm -hmm. for coastal Labrador. If we take a look at the future tracker, we can see that snow move in uh, as that low continues to track a little bit further west towards the coast, and it'll spread that snow down across most of Labrador into the afternoon. And then we can see uh, some snow moving across the island as well. So it looks like a little bit of a messy day. Those winds are going to pick up yet again. So some blowing snow certainly expected into Sunday, though, as we head towards Sunday morning, things will generally clear out. So it'll be a quick system that uh, moves through. Temperatures are going to recover a little bit. We're going to be back to uh, around seasonal. It actually is still a little bit below, but better than what we've been seeing over the past week or so. Corner Brook sitting at about minus seven. Again, that risk of flurries or light snow through the day. Minus five for Gander. Minus two will be your afternoon high in St. John's. As we head towards the Straits, more of uh, some sunshine in the forecast. Temperature sitting around minus 10. And then uh, generally looking at that snow and potentially blowing snow uh, for the coast. Nain will be sitting around minus 13 for Saturday. Now, as I mentioned, looking ahead, that low will uh, pull away on Saturday and in behind it, a little bit of a high pressure moves in, which means things should stay quite clear through most of Saturday or rather Sunday. And then we'll see the next system move in quickly behind it, which is going to bring in some cloud cover and then some snow by the time Monday morning rolls around for uh, most of Labrador and then into the island as well. Now with this, we're going to see a big push of warm air as well. So things will transition over to rain right now. It looks like most of the island will see that potentially even uh, the northern peninsula and then stay as snow up through Labrador through the day on Monday and then into Tuesday. That low will track just a little bit further north and behind that we'll see some more snow uh, in uh, through Labrador clearing out generally for most of the island, but then uh, we could see some more rain again on Monday and uh, for the early parts of Tuesday. So here's a look at your forecast for St. John's and Eastern Newfoundland. Some squalls again tomorrow with some windy conditions continuing sun on Sunday, and then that temperature will climb up above zero for Monday and Tuesday with that transition and then windy conditions as well. Now for uh, central portions of Newfoundland, we're looking at uh, those cooler temperatures tomorrow, slowly climbing as we head towards the end of the weekend, and then that snow transition to rain for Monday and Tuesday, potentially some flurries, uh, could be some scattered drizzle as well in the morning. Now for Western Newfoundland, squalls again tomorrow, windy conditions, hot climbing, not quite as warm though, but one degree for Monday with that transition from snow to rain and then up through Lab Eastern Labrador. We're going to stay uh, in these minus teens tomorrow and then back to the single digits. So around seasonal for this time of year, finally on Sunday at minus three with plenty of sunshine and then Western Labrador uh, looking at uh, similar temperatures as well by the time Sunday and Monday rolls around. Now let's head back down to, to Anthony at the Bowhouse in Kitty Vitty where a book launch is happening that marks a sad anniversary in this province. Anthony. Uh, thank you very much, Ashley. You are looking at the book, 18 Souls, The Loss and Legacy of Cougar Flight 491. We've been talking about that on Here and Now. 
It says loss and legacy, and that loss and legacy has brought family members. You met some of them today on uh, our program. The man who uh, wrote this book, the author, is Rod Etheridge, and I should mention uh, Rod is a producer with CBC. He produced and did the research and writing this book on his own time. So, Rod, let me ask you this. Why did you want to write this book? In a nutshell, I, I just wanted to know who these people were. It goes back about two years, and uh, I was watching the coverage of the 8th anniversary, and it struck me that we had the obligatory line in the media, 17 people died, and then it went, the rest of it was talking about helicopter safety, offshore safety, and the survivor, two important subjects. But I just thought, who were the people who died beyond the line that 17 died? So I just wanted to find out who they were, tell their life stories, and put down in print the, what they meant to their families. Right, so you wanted to get beyond, I guess, the, the constraints of a, of a quick news item. Exactly, because when I did talk to families, I would say, tell me about, you know, this person, about that person, and they'd say, oh, they were great. And I said, yeah, but why were they great? Tell me stories. And that's what I wanted to get at, the heart of the people. What did they work at? What, what caused them to end up and get on a helicopter that day and fly to the offshore? Right. Let me ask you this, Rob, because in our business, of course, we meet people who go through all kinds of different tragedies. But we had Kevin Duggan on earlier, a very powerful story that it, you could tell talking to him, even though we're marking this 10 years next Tuesday, it's, to him it seemed as though it was just yesterday when he was talking about his son, Wade. How do you interview people and get them to rethink about one of the worst things that ever happened to them. That was the toughest part of it. People say, you know, was it tough writing this book? I didn't find the writing tough. It was sitting down with the families. When I would talk to them, I would say, can I come to your house? I want to see your life for a day or two days or however long. I, I drove to Fortune and spent the day with Birch and Ash's uh, parents. I drove to Aquaforth and spent the day with uh, Alice and Mara's family. I just want to see what their lives were. And when you spend six, seven, eight hours with someone, it goes beyond, how are you today? Um, they would just tell me stories. I had no preset questions. I would just say, tell me about Allison. And based on their answer, we talked more. And inevitably, every single one of them would say, let me tell you about that day, because they feel it today as much as they felt it 10 years ago. Final question for you. One, one aspect, of course, of this horrible tragedy was there was an inquiry afterwards, and there were some recommendations made that still haven't been implemented. Many of the family members that I talked to, even the ones who wouldn't go on camera, said you know, there, there's still a level of anger how does that come through in the book, if at all? It does a little bit because there are people out there who question search and rescue that day. Why, why, was, why weren't the, uh, the rescuers, uh, the searchers out there faster? Uh, there's still a lot of questions about why wasn't this problem with the helicopter fixed earlier if they had known about it eight months earlier, which they did. Uh, some families talk about that today, but I found that they aren't consumed by it. They can live their life being angry, or they can accept reality and, and live with the right. memory of the person and the legacy of the person. That's why you see community parks, uh, scholarships, music scholarships, hockey scholarships, because they want to remember what the person lived for, not what they died with. Well, listen, Rod, um, good luck with the book. And uh, a lot of people were here tonight signing that, and you've got to sign quite a few, and uh, all the best. You're welcome. Thank you. All right.
Welcome back to Here and Now. And now for some do-it-yourself advice and the latest video in a series we call Kelly Mechanic. Yeah, and this time Kelly Denine walks us through how to change an air filter. Yes, intimidated, no need. <laughs> Breathe easy and just do it yourself. It's important to have a good clean air filter in your car so that way you can keep it running good on the road. It also helps with fuel mileage. So today I'm gonna to show you how to install this filter in your car. The very first thing you've gotta do is locate the air filter box on your car. On this car, you can see that it's located here on the side of this hose that connects to the motor. On the side of the air filter box, you'll see screws that hold the box down in place. Get your proper screwdriver and use your screwdriver to remove those screws. Once your screws are removed, grasp the air cleaner box and pull up on it. You'll see that the filter is located directly underneath it. It's just laid in place, so reach in and pull it out. You can see from looking at this filter that it's only a little bit dirty. We're going to replace it anyway since we've got one here. Remove your new filter and slide it underneath the air filter box. Push down to make sure that it's firmly in place. And replace your air filter box. Locate your screws again and install them back into tabs, making sure that they line up with the bottom holes. Most car manufacturers recommend replacing your air filter every 20,000 kilometers or at least once a year. But other things can affect your air filter as well, including driving conditions, weather, and even the leaves that are on the ground. So make sure that you change yours regularly and keep your car breathing normally. easier than I thought. I see <laughs> Kelly Denina runs a garage here in St. John's and you can see that video and more on our website at cbc.ca slash nl and on our YouTube channel. So Ashley, you're pretty handy. Have you ever changed an air filter in a car? Not an air filter, uh, but I have definitely changed a headlight which is pretty easy That's good. and that looked pretty easy too so i was just quite surprised actually <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> i need to change my fridge water filter ah, well, <laughs> that one i can't help yeah <laughs> so we have a weather picture we do this is our weather photo of the day today great shot taken there a lighthouse yeah kind of okay. hard to figure out oh. what that is but finally we got some from the northern peninsula which is kind of nice port sanders nice yeah Beautiful shot. Yes, so um, Lillian sent me this photo on my Facebook page from uh, across the harbor. So it's nice there. Keppel Island? Keppel Island, yeah. Fantastic. Yeah, so beautiful shot there. Thank you so much, Lillian, for sending that photo in. We love to see your photos from around the province. Send us them uh, either to my Facebook page or to uh, nlphotos at cbc.ca, and we will try and get them on the show. Yeah. And kids, don't forget your weather whiz kid That's right. picture as well, That's your right. drawing or your painting to send in. Yeah, because yeah. those are awesome. I love yeah. seeing those too. And then the little stories that I get with them, it's so <laughs> nice. <laughs> well, that's it for us here in the studio. Uh, Anthony will be back uh, tomorrow. I think you guys are actually going to be out again tomorrow. We are. Well, yeah, tune in and uh, we'll see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. Good night. <laughs>